You know, we don't use the term alienation much anymore. It used to be the rallying cry of young adults when I was a young adult. It was like a password needed to gain entry into a select group of brooding young people hanging out in cafes in Greenwich Village. Oh, we were so alienated. <laughs> Alienation tried to explain the malaise we felt when questioning the prevailing values of society. There was a very obvious disconnect between, between the principles at play in the day-to-day -day world and our own sense of bringing a higher moral standard to bear in our daily lives. So this discrepancy between the life going on all around us, and what we personally felt to be a, a better or more authentic life led to another word that we interchangeably used with alienation, and that's the word isolation. I think it's fair to say that this feeling of isolation is felt by the young adults of every generation. It's indicative of the perennial clash between the idealism of a better world and the status quo which hangs relentlessly on to, to things as they are. You know, do not disturb the universe. But generations of young adults differ, I believe, in how vociferously they lament the, the isolation they feel. And they vary also in the degree to which they actively criticize the prevailing norms of society and the extent to which they are inspired to introduce change. Now, I am no expert on today's millennial generation, but by all accounts, they seem to express their alienation through a well, kind of a, um, what's the word, kind of an indifference towards society, community, and, and making commitments. The dim economic prospects in society today has an accumulating numbing effect on young adults, as opposed to, let's say, the, the flower children of the 60s, whose immediate concern for income was never much in doubt. And thus, they felt empowered to take over the streets, take over the universities, while clamoring for change. Now, this morning, I want to consider two young adults who literally wrote the book on alienation. Karl Marx, who at the age of 26, wrote the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844, also known more simply as the Paris Manuscripts, preceded by a year, Henry David Thoreau's publication in 1845 of Walden Pond. Thoreau was 28 years old. Now, both Marx and Thoreau spoke to the malaise that hung like a dark cloud affecting society in both Europe and in this country as it was transitioning from an agrarian to an industrial society. Their respective commentaries address not only the isolation felt by their generation, but effectively transcended the young adult demographic to a wider sense of alienation and isolation that was permeating all of society. Marx introduced yet another term, estrangement. Estrangement, which is entirely compatible with Thoreau's views expressed in Walden Pond. Now, I find it especially chilling that their discourse on alienation from about 170 years ago 
finds astonishing relevance for us today. Contemporary writers often refer to the ailments facing us today as a spiritual crisis, a spiritual crisis that affects the nation as a whole and, of course, us individually. Today's writers address the issues of our society as it moves from industrial to technological, with the constructs of a virtual world isolating us further and further from any spiritual content. It seems rather obvious that today's social critics are addressing actually the same condition or the same malaise as Marx and Thoreau. And those include alienation, isolation, estrangement, all responsible for manifesting a spiritual crisis. That's what they called it back then, 170 years ago. That's what we're calling it today. For Marx, the issue of alienation developed around, now in his words, a separation from nature. This is not Thoreau now. This is, this is Marx saying that this alienation we feel is due to a separation from nature. And he goes on to explain. Under capitalism, people had to rely on their own labor in order to live. The ticket to subsistence, then, was through money alone. And this meant leaving the natural world for the industrialized world in order to, in his words, become a slave of one's own work. One became the slave to one's own work just to survive. And in a fascinating way, Marx notes this distinction between living and surviving as a worker. What an interesting difference, living and surviving. If just surviving becomes our chief preoccupation, we are drained, it stands to reason, we are drained spiritually. For Marx, that meant that while in a survival mode, the worker suffers a loss of fulfillment in his own human nature. Marx's terms a loss of fulfillment in his own human nature when we are in this just survival mode. Alienation results when the worker feels that he is perceived as an object. Man becomes the property of the owners of industry. The market price of goods produced does not add value to the worker's wage, but goes back to the capitalist's capital. And so a vicious cycle ensues. In order to exist, just exist, the worker grows increasingly dependent on his employer. And as the worker is denied the fruits of his labor, meaning compensation for the work he does. He grows further and further alienated and feels, in Marxist terms, feels machine-like with no nurturing possibilities to, to feed the spirit of his or her own nature. Now this observation is not terribly far removed from today's malaise rooted in the relentless widening of disparity in wealth. Wages have been depressed for years, while profits soar to greater heights these days than even during the Gilded Age. In the 1950s, economic theory posited that a market economy could distribute monies equitably without state intervention. They argued that wages and profits would rise at the same pace. Ha, ha, ha. Obviously, this theory has turned out to be 
far from accurate, where enormous wealth and deep squalor exist concurrently. And the awful truth is that the experts, the economists of, our, of today are saying that this disparity is going to grow definitely wider and wider in the years to come. It seems to be just unimaginable. We have today what I think most of us would consider a, a reprehensible economic hierarchy where, as once predicted by Marx, men exploit men. Now, Americans, as a rule, prefer not to deal with accusations of exploitation or discuss alienation because we believe that everyone, everyone in this country has the same opportunity, keyword opportunity, we all have the same opportunity to accrue great riches in America. In fact, it's the American way. And so in response to this egregious income inequality, Paul Ryan announces that poverty comes as a result of a culture within the inner city. Our current situation stems simply from, these are his words, our current situation stems simply from men not working or in fact generations of men not even thinking about working, preferring instead to live off entitlements. Now the issue that we confront today, according to Paul Ryan, and the conservative leaders of his party who certainly concur, this malaise that we feel or this failure to uh, or this, this apparent or obvious uh, income inequality that we have is due to a failure by the poor to take or assume any responsibility themselves. But what the chairman of the House Budgetary Committee and his followers failed to address is that after adjusting for inflation, wages have fallen for 60% of working American men over the past 40 years, while profits, as we know, have escalated to, to inconceivable heights. The distinction between living and surviving remains as relevant today as it was when Marx wrote the Paris manuscripts. Yeah, people are slaves to their work, and people feel no or very little fulfillment in their own human nature. How do you describe what's happening in society today? Well, the spirit runs on empty. Well, this all sort of makes you want to escape to Walden Pond, doesn't it? But Walden Pond just may be one of the most misunderstood books of all times. 